preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, I'm Jennifer Hausler from the Charles Simon Center for Adult Life and Learning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Ruth and Oliver Stanton About Women Lecture Series. I hope that you've all picked up by now our new summer catalog and seen all the great events that we have planned. Um, just a couple of things that did not make it into the catalog that I'd like to announce. On uh, Tuesday, June 1st, Robert McNamara will be here interviewed by Morley Safer. And I'd also like to announce that Barbara Walters will be interviewing Joy Behar on Sunday, May 9th. That's a week from tonight. And tonight we are thrilled to have Anne Royfe here to talk about her new book, 1185 Park Avenue, a memoir about her life growing up wealthy and Jewish on the Upper East Side. She's also the beloved writer who gave voice to a generation of women's experience. Her book, Up the Sandbox, is considered a feminist classic, and she is currently a regular columnist with the New York Observer. And also tonight, we are very fortunate to have as our interviewer a person who is as close to Anne Royfe as it is possible to be, her daughter Katie. Katie is the author of two recent nonfiction books about current issues that have received much attention. They are The Morning After, Sex, Fear, and Feminism on Campus, which also earned her a cover story on the New York Times Magazine. It tackled the subject of date rape. And last night in paradise, sex and morals at the end of the century, a book that examines how the AIDS crisis has affected American sex lives. She holds a PhD in English from Princeton University. Please welcome Anne and Katie Royfe. Thank you. Can, can everyone hear me? OK. Um, I am gonna, we're going to start out and have a sort of a conversation about my mother's new book. And then we're going to leave some time for questions that you might have from her. Uh, OK, I'm going to start out by reading just one small paragraph from this book. Another story is about my father's father. Shortly after arriving, he walked the streets looking for an apartment to house his family. He wandered over to Fifth Avenue and saw a for rent sign. And he looked at the grand building and the doorman with a gold braid on his jacket and he asked the rent. He was told 250 and he rejoiced. He was right to have come to America. He went back to his cousins and gathered his, the children and his wife and his wife's sisters and walked with them, carrying all the suitcases and bundles to Fifth Avenue. Then the doorman, pointing his finger at the Greenhorn family, laughed and said, 250 a month. My grandfather had thought the rent had been for an entire year. Ah, he said to the doorman in his heavily accented English, it won't suit us after all. So my question about, about this anecdote is, is it true? And, and furthermore, the, the question is, is a broader one, which is that you are a novelist. And novelists, and, and a storyteller, as I well know personally. Um, and storytellers are tempted to embellish, to invent, to create stories that illustrate a principle which they believe to be true. So um, my question to you is about that one passage, but also about the book in general. To what extent do you embellish in this book, which is a memoir? That's a trusting question from a daughter. <laughs> um, it's an interesting question because uh, it gets right to the heart of memoir, a memoir versus fiction. Um, and I have uh, handled some of this material in fiction. Um, the way I saw it, and I'm sure for each writer it's different, the way I saw it was 
that everything in this book that is reported must be true because it is called nonfiction. Uh, I'm old-fashioned enough to believe that when I say something is true, I believe it to be true. Uh, now, part of the truth in this book is things that other people told me. There's no way to research a story such as the one that uh, Katie just read. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm assuming that my mother, was, who told me the story, was telling it to me to the best of her ability. What it then becomes is family truth. Uh, she believed it. She heard it. Whoever told it to her probably believed it. And I believed it all my life. Now, could it be apocryphal? Yes. Uh, could it be, um, uh, could it have changed? Could it have a grain of truth in it and then have changed over the time as it was passed on? Of course. But uh, what I was dealing with here, every word that, every story, every fact, everything that's in this book is something that someone either told me and believed was true or something I knew myself was true. Now, how do I make it a good story? When my mother told it to me, um, I heard it with a six-year-old's ear. I'm sure the sentences were completely different. I'm sure the way she put it was different. There's a lot of work that went into telling that story in such a way that uh, it would sound reasonably good in case one's daughter happened to read it at a platform <laughs> sometime or other. Um, so, so that uh, the shaping is is my doing. Uh, it's my craft. But um, the answer is, uh, I think um, nonfiction, I think we are confused enough in this world so that we, we all ought to be able to trust what it says in the front of the book. If it says this is a memoir, you all ought to be able to believe, for better or for worse, uh, this is so. OK. Um, now, looking. Uh, specifically at, at some of the relationships in this, in this book. I'm going to read um, briefly about your father falling in love with your mother. Our mother was a small woman, not five feet tall. This is significant because my father, who was a little over six feet tall, in all sincerity admired very tall women. So why did he marry my mother, who was the very opposite of his ideal. In a more perfect world, it would have been because he fell in love with her soul, with that fragile, insecure, curious, sharp, not quite regular soul. In a more perfect world, he would have fallen in love with the way her lipstick smeared across her upper teeth, the way her glasses were always catching in the web of her veils, the way her mascara would run down her cheeks, the way her slightly too large nose with the not quite fortunate bump in the middle was always in need of powder the way she dropped everything, the way cigarettes burned in ashtrays all around her like votive candles in a church. And he would have liked the way she could do the New York Times crossword puzzles in 15 minutes flat, even though she hadn't gone to college. In a more perfect world, he would have married her because he wanted to take care of her, cherish her against the wear of time, count the spill of brown freckles on her pale skin, watch her plump thighs move under her lace-trimmed silk slip, but truly, he preferred tall women, and he married her because she was rich. So, um, so that sets up, for people who haven't read the book, a little bit about this relationship. And the thing I want to ask you, and this is a very, if you read the book, it's a very tormented relationship involving lots of other women, lots of nastiness, and lots of cruelty. And in general, my mother, I think I'm fair to say, sees this relationship from the point of view of her mother. But I want to ask you um, about that Oscar Wilde quote, if you marry for money, you earn it. <laughs> and in what way did your father earn that money he married for? Well, let's go back <laughs> to Oscar Wilde. I assume that what he meant by that was, uh, if you marry for money, um, you're stuck with the person that you married. And um, you may have 
lovely silverware to eat your dinner with, but uh, your companionship at the dinner table is going to be um, less than wonderful. And that is certainly uh, what happened to my father in that I think he, um, I think he was angry. I think he felt belittled because he was an American male of the first generation. And American men of the first generation felt they should be the ones with the money, they should be in charge, they should take over, they should have earned it. Uh, so I think that he was humiliated. And at the same time, um, he was never satisfied. And, and there was a lot of, um, it was pointed out to him very frequently that he was ungifted with money, and it was pointed out to him very frequently that he was ungifted in love, and that there was a lack of love, and a complaint about the lack of love. And therefore, you know, while my sympathies are with my mother, um, as they belong, um, <laughs> uh, I think that, um, that he has a story too. And he has, uh, he has a side. And I tried very hard in this book um, to find it, to present it, to create some um, sympathy for him. Um, I did the best I could. Obviously, from Katie's comment, I, I, didn't, I wasn't completely convincing. But I did try. Uh, the, the, thing with, um, the thing with parents, I suppose, is that Children never actually see them very accurately. I mean, there's always there's always some distortion. There's always some mistake. And I'm um, I'm prepared now to say that there must have been things about my father I didn't know. That maybe there was a side to him that uh, came out with other people. Um, somebody wrote me a letter after reading this book who said that they had been in a court case with him, another lawyer, and he was very courtly and very kind to the other lawyers. And I thought, oh, really? You know, that's a side, that's someone I didn't know. Um, and of course, I guess um, we're, we're such complicated creatures that we can fool ourselves. I may be completely wrong. Maybe he was the hero. He should have been the hero of the book, and my mother should have been uh, the villain. Is. Um, but I did it the best I could in order to do what I thought was necessary to do, which was to tell the truth. OK. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to the end of the book, toward the end of the book, and read one sentence about what happens. And this is, this is at, about my mother's first husband. My elegant husband, my tall, handsome husband, my artist, my writer, my passport to immortality is drinking up all the money I make as a receptionist at a public relations firm. So my question to you about that is, is one of the lessons of this book um, or the, the uh, themes that you're trying to get across about how history repeats itself? And if you can talk a little bit, for the people who haven't read the book, about meeting your first husband and the ways in which he resembled um, your father. Well, the ways in which um, my first husband resembled my father uh, completely escaped me when I met him. So I, I have to go back and try to uh, let, me, let me just tell you what I saw. I saw uh, an elegant, tall, thin man who was extremely literary um, and was involved with the ballet and um, was um, a student at collegiate school and seemed um, not at all typical of a collegiate student at that time or perhaps ever and um, was a, um, he was as close to Holden Caulfield as a person can get and not be Holden Caulfield. And uh, I thought because he was um, interested, because he was um, a writer spirit and an artist spirit and an outsider, that he was completely unlike my father, that I had found the complete 
opposite. Um, it proved not to be true, and I think this probably happens um, not uncommonly with people that you, you, you run away from your fate and you find yourself wrapped right in it. Um, it was true of Oedipus. It was true um, of many others in between Oedipus and me. And I think, I think that uh, what, um, what I was hoping to say in writing about it, why I felt it belonged in the book, because it comes at the end, it's after the main story, it's not about my parents' marriage. Uh, most of the book is about what ha that marriage, that time, the childhood. But um, it belonged, I felt, because it was an echo. It was the coda. It was the, um, it was the logical result, which is that if, the, um, if we create homes in which uh, the father does, the father and mother um, miss each other in some profound way, it's very <laughs> likely that the next generation will create homes in which they will miss their own mates in possibly a different way, or possibly, as I did, in almost the same way. Um, this is, uh, this I thought was worth observing. Um, from, from that fact, I don't think we can draw any huge conclusions. Um, it, you know, it, it's just I would like to uh, hang a sign on, um, on all young people, you know, beware of your past. Uh, but um, given that you can't do that, uh, all I could do was simply describe this and um, see if it echoed into other people's lives and how other people experienced it. Um, another, another question I have about the larger uh, message of this book um, is it would it be fair to say or totally unfair to say um, that in some sense this is a morality play and that part of what you talk about here is a family that starts out with this immigrant family um, you know coming over to this country and living the American dream and you know pushing uh, you push carts on the Lower East Side and starting this great company and making millions of dollars and moving to Park Avenue and it's this inspirational story but somehow at this end of it that you describe, on, once you're on Park Avenue, there's something about this money that corrupts. And is it your belief um, that the money itself created the kind of soullessness and the kind of um, sort of moral and emotional decay that you write about? Um, and you know, this was, for people who haven't read this book, quite a soulless family, um, including Roy Cohn. Um, so she's writing about a very extreme family, I think. But uh, I, I want to know if, if the problem was, and what you're trying to say is a sort of 1930s Marxist point, that the problem was the money. Uh, well, um, and you mentioned Roy Cohn, and, and you accuse me of being a Marxist in the same <laughs> breath. You, you, you want something terrible to happen to me. Um, I think that if you had asked me at uh, 21 that same question, I would have said, it's the money that did them in, uh, if they had only been poor. And um, my mother, in fact, had a uh, continual fantasy, which is I wrote about in this book, and her fantasy was we would be driving along Bruckner Boulevard or um, the LIE in close to New York, and she would see these little houses that were attached to each other, and she would say, I think if only we lived there and your father and I ran a candy store together, I would be happy. And I would hear this, and I would think, yes, you know, if only you if only you had done that, if only you lived in that house, it is the money that's making you unhappy. Um, but this is, this is, of course, an, you know, a gross oversimplification. It's not, um, as I have found out in my adult life, uh, you know, somebody has to pay the orthodontist bill, and one does need money, and it isn't money that is itself the, um, the corrupter. What did happen that corrupted people, I think, was uh, an increasing distance from the tradition. And in, um, when they were poor Jews in 
Poland. Uh, they were wrapped and surrounded in community and in tradition. They um, were not, um, you know, I know in the Jewish world, um, you ask everybody and everybody is descended from a rabbi, a great rabbinical scholar. And for a long time, I thought, you know, I must be the only Jew in America who is descended from tailors. Um, <laughs> but um, it is, it is even if you were a tailor in that community, you knew the holidays, you knew what to do, you knew the words, you were part of the, you were part of the spiritual experience of the community. Um, with the coming to America, as everybody by now knows, there was this great, you know, clog up at the bottom of the ocean of all the tefillin thrown overboard, and um, it is, it. it it is, in a sense, it was reasonable, it was modern, it was progressive, it was to grab a new life, to make a better life for themselves and for their children, and I respect that. But in the process, some of the families, and not all of them, and you know, nobody has to jump up and tell me it wasn't all of them, I know it wasn't all of them, but some of them um, lost their um, lost their soul. They lost their, not simply their religion and their knowledge of religion, but um, the bindings into the community. And all that was left was the purchasing, um, was the money. And the fact that my father, for money, would marry my mother is a soulless act. It's an American materialism act. Now, to say that is not to... Um, is not to say they would have been better off all poor and starving. And it's not to say that, um, um, you know, Marx had it right. Um, but it is to say that if you make money, if you make your way in America and you give up everything else um, in the rush to become what you think of as American, if if it doesn't have any meaning to you, if it doesn't embody, if it doesn't include justice and, and social justice and whatever particular form of, um, of soul you need to have and your family needs to have and rituals that your family need to have, um, it's very hard. And, and I was writing about that passage from, um, I was writing about that loss, and I was writing about what it felt like to live with that loss of soul. That, that that's good. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that answers it. Um, although you know, you have one character. Um, maybe you can tell the story of the y idealistic young lawyer who marries to become a judge, and describe how that fits into what you're talking about. Well, I, there was a very idealistic young lawyer who very much wanted to be a judge because he admired and loved this country beyond anything else. And he admired the Constitution. And he admired the Declaration of Independence. And he went to law school. He put himself through law school. And when he graduated, he needed to uh, open a law office. And he went to a bank um, in the Bronx to get the money to uh, open his law office. And um, when he was in this bank, for some reason, the head of the bank uh, interviewed him. He attracted his attention, the application. They talked for a while. And um, the young lawyer admitted that what he wanted most in the world was one day to be a judge. And to be a judge in the Bronx at that time um, required $50,000 to the political powers that be. Um, and this young lawyer had no possibility of ever getting that kind of money. And the banker said, well, come home to dinner with me. I have an unmarried daughter. And he introduced him to his unmarried daughter, who was, um, my mother said, one of the ugliest women in the world, in the entire world, and certainly definitely the ugliest woman in the Bronx. And, <laughs> He married this woman, and her name was Dora Cohn, and his name was Al Cohn, and they had of this union, which was itself a compromise, uh, a compromise of love, came uh, a child who nearly brought down the very American system that the judge had loved and admired so much, Roy Cohn. And I do think that's a morality story, uh, and it's a 
Now, is it a true story? It's it's pretty true. My mother told it to me as the gospel truth. Um, I suspect it's mostly true. And when I told my mother that I was frightened of Dora Combe because she looked so much like the witch in um, Snow White, my mother said to me, oh, but you should have seen her years ago. She's gotten so much better looking. <laughs> so altogether, I think my story is true. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, since we are um, kind of living in an era proliferated by memoirs, um, one of the questions about memoirs um, has to do with the peop not just the person who's writing and, and their point of view, but the people who are writing, who they're being written about, and they have a different point of view, and they have their own version of what happened. And um, just uh, when my mother wrote, I think, her first book, um, one of her relatives went to every bookstore in her neighborhood on Madison Avenue to buy out every copy because she thought if she bought it out of the stores, none of her friends would see it. So um, there were people who were, you know, and there always are in all memoirs, not, not in this memoir, not, you know, in all memoirs, there are people who are angry. And there are the characters in the memoir who sort of wish that they could pop out of the book and wave their hands and say, you know, no, this isn't what happened. Um, and I bring this up because you recently wrote an observer piece about writer's guilt. And um, I was just curious about uh, the guilt or the, the, the guilt and then the impulse that overrides the guilt uh, in writing a memoir. <sighs> it's a very big question. <laughs> Um, we did not, we didn't, I just want you all to know that we did not rehearse this. So each one of these questions is coming to me as a complete surprise. Um, though that particular one is one that I've lived with a long time. Um, there is tremendous guilt at um, publicly uh, talking about um, your childhood, talking about people who were um, related to you, people you once loved and admired. Um, it's, you're breaking a terrible taboo, because we do have a taboo of talking, revealing skeletons in closets, uh, uh, shaming people, um, exposing ourselves. Um, and I, I know that this is, um, is not a... This is not something everybody can do. It's not something that everybody um, believes should be done. Um, for me, there's always been, there there have been two pushes to do it. The first is the intellectual one, and that's the rationale, and I will give you that one first, which is that um, the truth of how we live in its most um, minute particulars as we share it is um, the way we all will know uh, about ourselves and about our time and about our experience and it is a necessary um, and important piece of our communal knowledge. Now I believe that when I read other people's memoirs I gain. When I hear uh, other people's deepest stories, when they tell me the truth about what happened to them, I am enriched and my understanding is enriched. So why should not people's understanding be enriched by hearing mine? Uh, that's the um, rationale. Added to that, um, I suppose I've always been influenced by the fact that um, when we think about how Freud learned what he learned, uh, began to work in the mind in a different way. He worked story by story. He worked person by person. He worked uh, case by case. And from the cases came uh, new insights into how we all are. So the assumption is that anything that is truly true about me, anything I can find in my soul, is also true of other people out there. And that's another reason to really try to do this and to do this as well as possible. Um, and then there's the other part, um, which is the not rational part, um, but is equally true. Um, I'm a writer. Uh, what I do is write. Um, 
this is my story. This is my subject. I could have been a different kind of writer. I could have been a mystery writer. I could have been a um, romance writer. Um, I could have invented totally. I have sometimes, but not sometimes I haven't. Um, but I have chosen to tell my story the most direct route. That is the kind of writer I am. Um, now, it is possible that I may have other character flaws, um, which I will leave to your imagination, that um, lead me to do this. I think uh, it is, it's entirely possible. In fact, most likely. But uh, if you take it together, if you put it all together, what you have is um, a person who uh, is following their profession, which is basically an honorable profession, uh, in an attempt to add to our general truth, um, who tries to do as little harm as possible. I don't go out of my way to do harm. But when you write, in the course of writing this kind of book, you do harm. And um, if there is um, a reckoning in the hereafter, uh, I will be responsible for it. Um, on the other hand, um, if I do it well enough, I'll be pleased anyway. <laughs> but um, I, I, have a, I think that it's, it's interesting to hear you answer that question. And I wonder if there's something in your answer to that question that may have partly to do with your being a woman writer and not a man, male writer. And the reason I ask is that if, if I had, instead of you, Philip Roth sitting there, and saying, you know, all the people that you've written about and all the, you know, embarrassing, humiliating, disgusting details you've exposed of the people that are closest to you and that you love the most, why do you do it? He wouldn't have given the delicate, careful, um, intricate answer that you did. He would say, I'm an artist, and my art is more important than those people. And he would say a lot of things. He would, he would essentially say, all that matters is my writing. Um, and, you know, uh, Robert Lowell f used a, um, he, he wrote an incredibly nasty poem about his ex-wife, who he was in the process of leaving, um, in including her letters, like deep, heartfelt letters she'd written to him, these excruciating letters. He kind of excerpted them, and he altered them a little bit, but he used them in his poems. And, and several people, including the poet Elizabeth Bishop, objected. And she said, you know, is it worth it? You know, is, is it worth it to do this to somebody else? And, you know, he couldn't even understand her question. You know, he said, I'm a poet. <laughs> so I think that it's, I, I mean, my question to you is, is there something in this that does have to do with your being a, a female writer of your generation, all the hedging and all the apologizing? Um. If you're telling me I shouldn't hedge and apologize so much, uh, you may be right. But let me let me um, answer it, it seriously. Um, in my generation, um, women were certainly brought up um, to uh, attempt to be liked. Um, the first. Um, I don't know, I can't see because the lights are, are too uh, bright, uh, dimmed here or bright or something, but I, there certainly must be some of you um, of an age here to remember how to curtsy, because um, I remember how to curtsy. And uh, <laughs> um, thank you. Um, uh, the, it, it, doesn't seem quite right to me to just say, I am an artist, uh, and therefore I am entitled to do anything I want. Um, I do anything I want. I just don't feel actually completely entitled. And I think that um, the difference may very well be a male-female one. I know that men would say, you know, art is worth it. Um, art is, you know, for particularly in the 50s, let me go back. In the 50s, many of us believed that art was entitled to do anything, that the artist could do anything. The, the drunker he was, the more of an artist he was. The more he maltreated everybody around him, the more we knew he was a great artist, and that art was a value in and of itself. Um, I don't really believe that, and I, I believe that uh, art is one of the wonderful things in the world, and so is being decent to p other human beings, and so is being, you know, sober enough so that you don't uh, crash your car into a telephone pole. Um, 
So I'm not a great worshiper of the artist in the way that um, Robert Lowell would have been speaking out of that particular mindset. Uh, I think um, art um, and male ego, let's just, let's leave art out of this, let's just go into male ego. Male ego can say, you know, I, I did it, therefore it is good. Um, that's not the way I was trained. That's not the way I uh, I approach the world. Um, my feminine soul says, um, I believe it, maybe I'm right. You believe something else, maybe you're right. Um, if you are very angry with me, maybe you have a good reason to be angry with me. Um, that's why we have two genders. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, <laughs> maybe that, maybe. Um, but I, I just wonder whether, um, whether a younger generation of women would be able to say, you know, in the same way as I think these male writers were saying, um, yes, I have an exhibitionistic impulse. And yes, I'm gonna get up on this stage of this book and just show you, tell you everything that happened to me, even if it's going to hurt other people, because this is my story. Um, and I wonder if you know what you're talking about is is a generational thing, not just a gender thing. Well, in that case, then you have to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I don't know. I only have, you know, um. I know, you know, many. Uh, women writers, and even at the height of our arrogance and a sense of riding a wave into great new triumph, uh, none of us quite had that. You know, we are we are great. We are artists. We are entitled, and that sense of entitlement is, um, you know, it 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 doesn't seem to me to go with. Um, it doesn't go with my voice as it was trained to be, but maybe it goes with yours. I would be delighted. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't know. Uh, I don't think I don't think younger women writing memoirs are necessarily um, do feel quite as guilty, maybe um, as as your generation does seem to. Um, but anyway, I think we should open up for questions uh, from the from audience. Yes. I read your book. I found it really interesting. Um, my question is, I don't get the same impression that you're giving me the day of the lecture. My impression from your book was that, are you still angry? Really angry? Because the way you spoke of your father, you always tried to impress him. So you're you're asking, is she still angry? Is it? <laughs> That's the next book. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, the, there's um, there are too many questions there rolled into one. Let me just let me just discuss the anger issue. Um, of course, I'm angry. Um, but I'm also aware of the fact that uh, if we asked everybody in this room, everybody would have something to be angry at, uh, almost everybody. Um, you know, the, the human condition is hard, and, and family is, families are the only place to live, but they are also very hard. And um, what I think about being angry is uh, what I 
what I have tried to do is to be, um, is to understand what happened, to understand myself and my role in this, and to understand what the, pe the people in my family did to each other. Um, that's, that is, I think, that understanding is, I think, our salvation as, as human beings. I don't know of any other one. I have my own version of your inner state, <laughs> yes. which is that uh, I think that, of course, she's angry. And you're right that she hasn't expressed that up here. And you're picking up something in this book which is very heartfelt and driven, and that the drive to write this book is anger. And that what gets you to write something like this or to write almost any book or to write a novel and it is that very anger and that sense. I remember you once said to me, my mother once said to me, that every great novel and every book is written out of revenge. And I think, you know, in this case, you can see that as true. Um, and it may be something that she doesn't want to say about her own book, but I think it's in the book and that's what you're picking up. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about what I perceived as your divided loyalty early on, even when you were young, where you were sometimes wanted to be just there for your father to be sure you could do it better than your mother was doing it, and sometimes totally alienating him and on your mother's side. And I sense tremendous divisiveness within you. Should we, I think we better repeat the question. Oh, did everyone hear the question? No. Oh, okay. The question was um, about, uh, in the book, um, my mother is from early childhood on very divided in her loyalties between these conflicting parents. And um, sometimes it seems that she just wants to please the father and you know is on his side because he's the powerful, strong, glamorous one. And sometimes she's on her mother's side because she's uh, the weaker, injured, um, and generally more appealing one. So um, the question was for, to talk a little more about those divided loyalties. And I think the other side of the question, just to add one thing onto that, is um, you know here your father is running around with all these other women you know and behaving in this in these abominable ways really abominable why were you ever on his side uh, well um, i think those of you in the room and sitting next to me who were once little girls will understand that there is a love for the father that is um automatic um and um, unqualified, um, and it just it just is. Um, I think that um, sometimes my greater loyalty was my greater loyalty overall was probably to my mother because she talked to me, which is a great pleasure, um, and you know is certainly. If I did not emphasize that enough in the book, then that was my era. Um, you know, I, I had a genuine connection with her. On the other hand, I had a fantasy connection with the handsome father, um, the prince. And I think that um, divided loyalties in perfectly wonderful situations, if, if, if this had been a wonderful father and this had been a wonderful mother, th there would still be uh, divided loyalties. Sometimes you wanted one, you didn't want the other. Different ages of your life, different stages of development. Um, one parent or another seems more attractive and you really wish the other one would disappear down a hole. Um, that seems to me to be um, you know, normal for people in what I was writing about was the way that normal um, experience played out in this not quite normal situation. But And I think added to the divided loyalty also is the um, wanting, in a very, very painful, difficult situation where both sides are fighting, wanting to please everybody and wanting to be the athlete to please your father and wanting to do your nails to please your mother and and part of this division has to do with you know a certain kind of diplomacy well survival skills is what we call those and um i think that uh 
if you, um, what I want to be sure of before we leave this is that this book isn't just about these people. These people represent and speak for, um, every one of them, a whole host of other people who were standing in, who were living in the blocks of the apartment buildings living this way, uh, and in their own way f for other people who are living differently. Um, my hope is not that I told you about um, my parents' marriage to get it off my chest, uh, or even to get revenge, because I've already had revenge. Um, it's because I keep trying to say it better. I keep trying to say it right. I keep trying to say it in such a way that it will be of more value to the person who's reading it. Uh, I, I, I mean, I do think I'm done now. I don't think I will ever do this again. But that was the motive that kept me going over this again and again. Any other questions? Yes. Well, it's an interesting it's an interesting observation. I, I you know, I want to think about that a little bit before I, I just I just jump in. I suppose that um, I have written nonfiction books about political and cultural things in which I draw in some personal ones more in the more in Katie style, uh, as you have described it there. I, I think um, the techniques that you're talking about are valid either way, from either direction. Um, I think not to be interested in the political and cultural is to be moronic. I mean, this is, you know, then, then what you have is a uh, true confessions or a, um, you have, um, you know, a, a, a rosy show. Um, what, in order to make um, meaning that communicates that matters, to make something that matters in this world, it has to have repercussions. Now, there may be some that I'm not aware of, but I think they deserve, you know, they deserve comment. And the way Katie approaches um, political matters is the absolute down to the core, she believes the personal is political in some sense. And and I also believe that. I mean, I, I, I don't think that's, um, um, we can turn it around. Um, the political is personal, the personal is political. It doesn't matter which way you look at it. Um, it's, you know, I don't want to be bored, and I'm sure nobody else does either. And pure politics, um, pure sociology um, is not only, sociology is usually an error. And when it's not an error, it's just boring. Um, and therefore doesn't change or, or meet you or engage you. Um, and I think that that's the reason for the form. I don't know. Katie, maybe you, you went to this question. This is, no, that, this that was is, a question for you. This is about form. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and. No, I think um, part of what you're, you're picking up and um, pointing out is how close um, what we think of as social criticism and political criticism is to a memoir, which is to a novel. And to a certain extent, a lot of the books that you pick up that are called you know, social criticism are very close to this book, which is a memoir, or this book is very close to a novel. And that in some sense, this technique, which is not, um, you know, which is not mine alone, but is a kind of common one now to talk about um, larger cultural issues in personal terms, you know, it, it is all getting closer, and and the and the lines between all these different genres um, are blurring. So I, I do think that there is that, you know, if you go into a bookstore, you know, it's almost as if the bookstore of the future isn't even going to have, you know, any separate sections, um, and and that's the trend that you're you're pointing to. Yes.
Well, thank, thank you, thank you very much for, for responding. I really need to find that reacted to it. I just want to know, what do you think saved you? What made you come at this? Obviously, something was wrong. 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 Something was wrong.
Um, um, I'm, you know, I'm suddenly looking around for some wood to knock on. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, you know, terrible things really do happen to people, far more terrible than anything I wrote about in this book. Um, and, you know, that, that needs to be kept in mind in mean, some kind of proportion. This is just a, a little story, a little 20th century story. Yes. Um, I was able to pass it on to some of my children some of the time, um, which I think is about par for the course these days. Um, it was a long time in coming. It was a long journey. And that's another subject, uh, not the subject of tonight's um, discussion. But um, I have a very deep feeling about um, ritual and tradition and family. Um, that um, is, has been learned that was not in the home that I came from, but is one that I have um, moved towards in my adult life as a counterbalance to what I had learned growing up. There's a man in the back. Oh, yes. Yes, um, the you know we don't all move in lockstep um, in in through history you know as a group it doesn't happen quite like that and um, I was I mean if you think about it the beatniks at uh, the college I went to which was Sarah Lawrence were um, premature um, 60s hippies. And that it was moving, you know, it was moving towards um, a looser culture altogether. Um, and I was on an edge of that. Um, as far as the question of uh, the Jewish world breaking down in that way, I think that um, what was happening was um, not so much in my immediate generation where a lot of it held, but in the following one, the um, uh, people turned either back towards tradition and back towards ritual, um, or they left the Jewish world entirely. And um, that is, you know, many of them. And that was the impact of the assimilation in America. It was the impact of our history as it moved forward. Now, obviously, it isn't going to hit every family, you know, at 1232 on Tuesday. It's going to be discovered in a pattern slowly over time. Um, you, we are probably closer if we look at, you know, we're, we're part of the same process. Any social group is. It just, it just isn't uniform. Um, I, I hope that answers the question. I think we have time for one more question, if there is one. Yes. <laughs>
of those characters is, is portrayed in such a black and dark way, rapaciousness, um, a tremendous amount of uh, 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 absolute stinginess in, in, in the worst kinds of ways. Uh, it, it seems that you have taken the Maya characters in the book and painted them in a way which is entirely, unremittingly bad. Do you have anything good to say about any of those characters? Uh, well, I think Katie um, mentioned that um, you know that someone is going to feel exactly that way. Um, of course, um, what has to be remembered is that I wasn't writing a book about any of those people that you mentioned, um, some of whom I have enormous respect for. Um, what they've done in their lives. Um, um, they have been an enormously philanthropic. And, um, you know, it, however, my task was not to write about um, Howard Gilman and the ballet. Um, I, my task was to write about the, um, the psychological, um, uh, turns in this family. Now, it is perfectly true, and I, I believe it absolutely, that you could take any one of the characters that you mentioned, who are real people, um, and I could do an entirely um, flattering, wonderful portrait, which would make <coughs> people very proud of them. That was not my task in this book, my task was about something else. And everything I wrote in this book is also true. Uh, I, you know, I do not, I don't take it back. What I saw, I saw. What I reported <laughs> happened. Um, what was left out was enormous. Um, but, because nobody cares. Nobody, nobody in this room is going to gain, if I wrote a portrait of um, one of these people that you mentioned, and I wrote a full, complete life story portrait, their life story, which had its own pain in it and its own trouble in it and all kinds of things I did not put into this book, uh, some of which perhaps you know. Um, if I had done all of that, um, it is possible that um, no one would be able to read the book. Uh, no one would want to read the book. I'm a writer. I have to write this as a story. It's a memoir, but it's got to be read as a story. And that's, I think, the explanation. Um, and, and I think that's one of the fascinating things that you know we started out with that I tried to bring up about, about memoirs especially and about family stories especially is that within every book, there are hundreds of other possible books. There's other versions. You could take a minor character in my mother's book and do their point of view and write a whole different book, you know, casting her as this precocious, bratty, you know, <laughs> little kid. Um, and, and that's what's interesting. And I think what part of the thing that does come out of this type of book is, is, you know, that it is one person's version and that she writes, I think, in this book quite eloquently about how that's all she's trying to do and that, you know, all of these events and all of these stories could be seen through millions of different different prisms. And, um, and I think that that's, that's kind of what, what's interesting about, about these events or these facts or these stories is that they're not facts, they're versions. And, you know, that anyone is free, you know, and that's one of the things that, that you know, anyone is free to write their own version um, of their own facts. So uh, anyway, I th we're, unfortunately, we're out of time. But uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>